You've heard me read ads for brands like Audible, Heifer International, and The Great Courses, all amazing companies that I truly believe in. These ads keep the show free and introduce listeners like you to new products and services you'll love. It's a win for everyone, and I'm happy to have the help of Midroll Media to ensure that we continue to have great advertisers. If you're interested in advertising on the show, go to midroll.com slash QDT and click contact. Midroll also represents other great shows, including Everyday Einstein, The Get Fit Guy, and The Nutrition Diva, so you can reach an array of engaged listeners. That's midroll, M-I-D-R-O-L-L, dot com slash QDT. That's for quick and dirty tips. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between a cannon with two N's and a cannon with one N, and a meaty middle about the 2017 words of the year. But first, we have to talk about the word Eskimo. Back in late November, I debunked a myth about Eskimos having lots of words for snow, and the cliche follows a format like this. If Eskimos have a hundred words for snow, then people from somewhere else surely have a hundred words for whatever's common in their area. Like, if Eskimos have a hundred words for snow, then surely Seattleites have a hundred words for rain. Because that's how the cliche is always phrased, I had to use the word Eskimo. And I did talk about how there's no Eskimo language, but I left out that Eskimo is also an extremely troublesome word all by itself. Because, frankly, I didn't know. I read books and original linguistics articles to put together the piece because it was complicated, and I was trying to really focus on getting the language part right, and I checked the AP style book, but I never came across anything about how offensive Eskimo can be. Also, this clarification and apology was supposed to come out the week after the show— But I was traveling and some of the files got deleted off the server and nobody noticed while I was away. So it didn't get released when it should have. Therefore, I'm doubly sorry, both that I had a huge blind spot about the word and that this didn't come out in a timely manner. And for those of you who might not understand what the problem is, I'll explain. To start, thank you to a listener and Arctic researcher named Katie, who sent me a bunch of helpful links, and explained that, quote, while there may be some indigenous groups in the global Arctic who still use the word Eskimo, it's almost entirely inappropriate for Southerners to use that term, unquote. For example, in a 2015 Globe and Mail article, the president of Canada's National Inuit Organization wrote, quote, the word Eskimo is not only outdated, it's now largely considered a derogatory term. When Inuit mobilized in the 1970s to protect our rights, we started using the term Inuit to describe our people because that's our way of describing ourselves, unquote. It also seems there's a very heated debate going on about whether to change the name of the Edmonton Eskimos football team to something else. For example, one op-ed by an Inuit researcher had the headline, Edmonton Eskimos is a racial slur and it's time to stop using it. Both Dictionary.com and Merriam-Webster.com say that Eskimo is sometimes considered to be offensive. The AP Stylebook entry on the word Eskimo says that many Native peoples in northern Canada use the term Inuit and that writers should call people what they ask to be called. Based on the reactions I got, I'm going to write to the AP and suggest that they update that entry to make it more clear and explicitly say that some people consider Eskimo to be offensive. And again, I'm very sorry for using the word without more context and explanation. And now on to canon. Many of you probably noticed that there was supposed to be a segment about the two words that are pronounced canon last week. Well, that didn't go out like it should have either because of the same server problem I mentioned earlier, so here it is now. As a fiction fan, I'm always amused when people write about how a new book in a series or a new movie in a franchise deviates from canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, because a canon written like that is a large, heavy gun. These readers and viewers are actually annoyed because the new material deviates from canon, C-A-N-O-N an accepted body or collection of rules or principles. 
In this case, canon is the collection of rules, ideas, and history that govern the imaginary world. But canon is also used to describe a collection of official documents, the books of the Bible, authentic works of an author, Shakespeare's canon, and a religious or secular law. Canonical, with one N, is the adjective. For example, you could talk about the canonical books of the Bible or the canonical writers of the 17th century. There's also a verb form of the word. Saints are canonized, for example. In the 15th century and earlier, both forms of canon could be spelled the same way. But you live in the 21st century, so stick with canon with two N's for the weapon. Multiple listeners, including Waldo Berg and Carol Einerson, suggested a great memory trick. Remember that cannon, the weapon, has more ends by thinking of them as ammunition, cannonballs. A gun or cannon fires the same kind of ammunition over and over, kind of like the repeated ends in the word. If you're in a battle using a cannon, you want as much ammunition as possible. More ends equals more cannonballs, so cannon, the weapon, is spelled with two ends in the middle instead of one. Thanks for the tip. Before we get to words of the year, let's talk about audiobooks. They're great for helping you be a better you, whether you want to feel healthier, get motivated, or learn something new. And with an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more, Audible has all the audio content you need to start your year on the right foot. If you want to be healthier, try books like The Sleep Revolution, The Power of Habit, or The Obesity Code. Whether it's on your phone, through your car, from a tablet, or at home on an Amazon Echo, you can get through tons of books while doing almost anything. I actually listened to five complete audiobooks while I was on vacation. It was wonderful. And Audible even lets you switch seamlessly between devices, picking up exactly where you left off. Start a 30-day trial and your first audiobook is free. Go to audible.com gg or text gg to 500-500. The capital letters gg. That's audible.com slash gg or text gg to 500-500 for a 30-day trial and a free first audiobook. You can do it with audiobooks. And now, before you completely psychologically move on to 2018, let's have some fun looking back on the words of the year from 2017. The clear winner in the Word of the Year Follies was fake news, chosen by at least three different organizations, the American Dialect Society, Collins Dictionary, and the News on the Web Corpus. The American Dialect Society word is based on a live vote by people who attend the Linguistic Society of America annual meeting, which I had hoped to attend this year but didn't because of travel problems. It looks like a lot of fun, and in addition to fake news as the word of the year, attendees also chose bro flake as the most creative word of the year, blending bro, like dude, with the last part of snowflake, and defined as, quote, a man or boy who lacks resilience or coping skills in the face of disagreements or setbacks, unquote. And they chose me too as the hashtag of the year. Fake news also won their most likely to succeed category, Previous most likely to succeed winners included marriage equality and to ghost, meaning to abruptly end a relationship by cutting off communication, especially online. Collins is a British dictionary and noted a 365% increase in the term fake news in 2017 over 2016. The Collins blog post talked about the term emerging in 2016 when people noticed a large number of false news stories about U.S. presidential candidates, and then about how the term really took off in 2017 when it started being thrown around by politicians to describe any story they didn't like. I was still a journalism professor in 2016 teaching social media, and I remember being really alarmed by all the fake news stories on Facebook and then being just dismayed when the term fake news became politicized in 2017 because it made it so much harder to talk about the real problem. But people were using the term noticeably more often in 2017. 
The News on the Web corpus is run out of Brigham Young University by Mark Davies, and it also chose fake news as the word of the year based on data, looking at words that showed a big increase in use over the previous year and controlling for how often a word is or has been used in general. They found that in their corpus, fake news was used more than five times as much in 2017 as it was in 2016, so an even bigger increase than Collins saw. Alternative Facts, which won euphemism of the year in the American Dialect Society voting, came in second in the News on the Web analysis. A couple of other interesting things emerged from the News on the Web corpus. First, although use of the name Trump only increased by about 50 percent, they found a big increase in words derived from Trump, including Trumpism, Trump world, Trump-like, Trumpery, and so on. Second, they found that Fidget Spinner had a spike in late May of 2017, but fizzled out. Which matches what I saw on store shelves. They seemed to be everywhere, but only for a while. Every other 2017 Word of the Year winner also had a political sensibility. Merriam-Webster chose feminism, noting that it saw a big increase in lookups for the word throughout the year, with big spikes related to specific news events, such as the Women's March on Washington in January and the release of the Hulu series The Handmaid's Tale. Dictionary.com chose complicit, saying it saw a 10,000% increase in lookups after Saturday Night Live aired their satirical ad showing Ivanka Trump hawking a made-up perfume called Complicit and an even bigger spike a few weeks later when Ivanka Trump gave an interview saying she didn't know what it meant to be complicit. The British newspaper The Telegraph ran a poll for its word of the year, and its readers chose Kofefe, C-O-V-F-E-F-E, which is actually not a real word. It showed up in a tweet from Donald Trump in late May, when, from context, it appears he meant to type the word coverage. The tweet read, Despite the constant negative press covfefe, which caused a flurry of confusion, jokes, and alarm. Since the tweet also stopped mid-sentence, people wondered whether something had actually happened to the president. The British Cambridge Dictionary chose populism as its word of the year, which could apply to British, American, and global politics. The dictionary defines populism as, quote, political ideas and activities that are intended to get the support of ordinary people by giving them what they want, unquote. And the dictionary saw an overall increase in use and spikes related to news events, such as when Pope Francis said that populism can mean different things in different parts of the world, but he worries that populism gave rise to Hitler and that in times of crisis, people sometimes lack good judgment. In other words, what they think they want might not be the best thing for them. Oxford Dictionary is also a British dictionary stuck to local politics with its choice, youthquake. This one had many people in the U.S. scratching their heads. I'd never heard the term, but according to Oxford, its editors saw a five-fold increase in use from 2016 to 2017, largely related to the unexpectedly high number of young voters who turned out in the U.K.'s general election. It was a youthquake like in earthquake, significant and unexpected. The Australian National Dictionary Center also stuck to national politics with its choice, Kwasi. I hope I'm saying that right. K-W-A-U-S-S-I-E. Like Broflake and Youthquake, Kwasi is a blend mixing Kiwi and Aussie to describe, quote, a person who is a dual citizen of Australia and New Zealand, unquote. It became a big deal this year when, according to ABC News, quote, a dual citizenship crisis prevented six senators, one deputy prime minister, a Senate president, and one MP from holding office. And to end on a happy note, the Haggard Hawks website word of the year was agathism, the belief that all things eventually get better, though the means of getting there may not be easy. It emerged as an English word in the early 1800s and comes from the Greek word agathos, which means good or noble. Haggard Hawks is a website that covers obscure words, language facts, and etymology. Thanks this week to Temple Wong, who's a longtime listener from Shenzhen, China, and listens while hiking in the mountains. 
And Dave from San Francisco, who listens on Spotify while walking his dog, Louie. Thank you to IDS Shark 626 who left a nice review at iTunes. And an especially big thanks to R. Niolin, who left an especially big review. Thank you. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my articles and older podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>